heard AM, you've heard FM. Now, tune into DM Radio, the world's longest running show about data. Each week, host Eric Cavanaugh interviews the brightest minds in the world of information management. Want to be on a show? Send an email to info at dmradio.biz. Now, here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the longest running show in the world about data. It's called DM Radio. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh here with an all-star cast, folks. I'm really excited about this show. We're going to get into the absolute hottest topics in the world of data management today. We're going to be hearing from Naveen Rao, CEO of Mosaic ML. And yes, that's the company that just got bought by Databricks for a cool $1.3 billion. And we'll hear from an industry veteran as well. Ger Steif is the president of business automation over at BMC. So we're going to talk a lot about automation, right? Because these new large language models that we're hearing about, ChatGPT, Google has barred, uh, GitHub has Copilot. There are lots of these things out there. Databricks has Dolly. In fact, I think it's already Dolly 2.0. What are these things? We're going to find out. They are very complex. They're very powerful. I think they really have pushed AI into the mainstream of business understanding. And of course, Microsoft had a lot to do with that by throwing a whole bunch of money at ChatGPT. But uh, these tools certainly can be misused. We're going to talk about how to properly use these technologies and how to weave them into the fabric of your business. And like I say, we've got two super experts. I will say I'm very impressed with the capacity of these engines to generate original content. And really, you have to master the prompt. You have to figure out how to tease out what you want from it. And you, of course, have to watch out for these so-called hallucinations, which is ChatGPT said themselves are really more of a feature and not a bug. Because the idea with these language models is they are fusing together vectors of information drawn from the corpus of text that they were built upon, they, the models are trained upon, based upon user prompts. So you can get it to say pretty much what you want it to say. And the idea is to get yourself to a place where you can work with content that is meaningful for your business and gets the job done. So that does take some training. We're going to talk about that. And we may get into small language models as some folks are starting to refer to them. But uh, let's kick it right off and bring in Naveen Rao from Mosaic ML. Congratulations on the acquisition. That's a huge deal. I think Databricks is on fire these days and making a lot of really good decisions about building out their stack. And of course, they built this whole empire on Spark, on Apache Spark. They're doing amazing things. And you're this whole other half that comes in and helps them complete this very interesting picture and vision. So tell us quickly like why you're excited to be with Databricks and what that all means for the end user out there. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. And uh, yeah, the, the deal just closed. So it's all very fresh. But uh, really the high level vision is it's almost obvious really. Uh, the, the fuel that makes large language models work and you know, uh, adds all this value to enterprise and, and whatnot is, is all based on data. And it's based on um, good quality data that's filtered for truth or for particular kinds of content. Databricks has built a huge practice up here. Uh, they've gained the trust of a lot of customers in the enterprise and they're growing really fast. And really, you know, our vision at Mosaic as an independent company was, you know, start from, from your clean data source and then we can get you all the way to a served model that you can integrate into an application. So we kind of bridge the gap between that after the data has been cleaned all the way to, you know, training and serving those models. Now we can, we can extend that journey much more. We can say, well, you start with these data lake, um, uh, like lake house services, dump your data in there. You have data governance, you have ETL, you have all the things that come with Databrick, and then you connect it to expressing that data through a model. And so now we can go from raw data all the way to serve model, which I think is just quite amazing, really. Well, yeah. And so let's talk about this importance of data quality and governance and trusted data, because of course, some of these models like ChatGPT was built on anything they can find in the World Wide Web, which is a lot of yeah. accurate stuff, but it's a lot of opinion, for example. <laughs> it's a lot of other stuff out there. And so you've taken out of the gate a more focused approach on working with governed, trusted data. So basically, you are optimizing the chances for this engine getting things on target early instead of late. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, you know, we talked about hallucinations a moment ago. I mean, some of some part of why these models hallucinate is that they're trained on on data that's incorrect, right? That has actual hallucinations in it. It's a, it's Reddit, it's Twitter, it's a whole bunch of different things, right? Uh, not to say that a model won't hallucinate on, on 
quote unquote correct data, but uh, it's because it's interpolating between different data points and things like that. But you can really constrain the behavior. And what, what this offers, what this platform now offers is I can actually select the kinds of data that go into a model and have control over what that model does and its behavior. Mm -hmm. And then I can tune that model to better serve my end application, right? If I'm building a support bot for my business, if I'm a bank or something like that, I don't really want it to philosophize about the fall of Rome. I want it to talk about banking needs of right. my customers. Right. And I don't want it to talk about competitors, right? I want it to talk about our services at the bank, right? So controlling that is actually quite important. And if someone builds a general model, they're not, they're not contemplating these really specific use cases. And really... Putting the right data in gets you the right responses out. Data in, data or garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. It's a uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know. Yeah. Well, what kind of excites me about these models is being able to point them at your corporate data in a trusted manner, in a secure manner, and then learn from what you have. So we've talked for years. I mean, this is the 16th year of this show. We've talked about data for a long, long time now, and data is, you know, at best 20 percent of the corpus of content that you have in your organization. The other 80% is unstructured data. It's right. emails, it's documents, it's contracts, it's all sorts of different things, which hitherto were very difficult to assess at any scale, which is kind right. of why it was sort of ignored, right? I mean, we almost have just swept it. I wrote an article just today or last night, I finished it, we, that was swept under the SharePoint is kind of how I <laughs> how I described it, because you just moved on and have to focus on stuff that matters and all that stuff was viewed as not really mattering. But guess what? There's a tremendous amount of knowledge in that documentation. So now all of oh. a sudden we have this tunable mirror that we can point at our corpus of, of data and understanding and start navigating under and understanding and then start scoring manually to your point. You can find things and go, aha, that's actually not correct. So we're gonna go ahead and change that and store that which if I heard correctly, Databricks will do in Delta Lake, which is interesting. So you're not yeah. losing any of that context, right? It's like you think about the old world of databases, you would overwrite something. Well, in the new world of databases, you append things, right? You don't necessarily yeah. overwrite. So the audit trail is still there. You can still fix something if it's broken, basically. But to me, that is an incredibly powerful transformation to be able to suddenly in a meaningful way, leverage this tremendous body of information and knowledge that your organization has, right? Yeah. And then also the kind of data governance around that, right? I mean, you may have data that's sensitive to some populations or not. So let's say you have a whole bunch of data from your customers. Um, maybe you have some of that data is even PII, uh, personally identifiable information. So you want to be able to build models that are maybe you can roll out generally. And then you may even want to build some models that are specific to particular customers or certain classes of customers. And so you can actually start to say like, well, I want to include this data. And I want to make sure that this other data is not included. And Today, it's, there's no good way to do that, right? You have to build a model with this. There's no way to extract data from a model once it's been trained. Right. So I think this is the kind of power that we're going to be bringing to the market. And I think it's going to be huge. Really, we're just at the beginning of, of understanding what LLMs can do for enterprise. It's, it's really going to be a game changer in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, let's bring in our other guests to kind of comment on this stuff a little bit and tell us what the, what they do. We have Gert Steif from BMC, and you've got this great technology that I've taken a briefing on a while ago, Control N, which is really like a control plane. So you got all this data science stuff that people are getting excited about, looking at the data, finding patterns in the data, classifying things, finding optimal opportunities really to focus your attention on, whether that's for new opportunities or fraud detection or whatever, you build these models to help your business. And then you have to get them in production. And that's usually where people have fallen down over the years. You can get a nice model, but then getting it into production, well, that's something BMC has been doing for a long time, right, Ger? Yes, uh, thank you, Eric. And thank you for having me on. This is, this is great. And that, you're exactly right. Uh, one part of driving value out of data is really building the model. And you've got to tweak the model and you've got to make sure that you get the model working right. But as we know, a lot of projects fail, not because the model doesn't work, but because moving this into production is some undertaking, right? We got to keep, keep tweaking the model and that's where DevOps come in, but we have to connect it to everything else that we have in our organization because we have to make sure that we get it running every day the right way. We have to bring in data from all of our different systems and we have to take actions in our business. 
So it's not just about orchestrating the data pipeline itself. It's about connecting it with everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, we have example of customers that use that, for example, to connect all the data points from engines they build to be able to predict whether or not an engine will experience a failure. That's mm -hmm. really cool. And some data science and data scientists can help you build a really cool model around that. But then it comes from science. It goes to engineering, right? Where you need to make sure that I can also connect this to my parts database. That may just be an old database that still sits in SAP or on the mainframe or somewhere on-prem. And my customer database and my dealer database and all those different systems and, and, and applications so that I can contact the owner of that truck with that engine and let them know, hey, by the way, That's right. you're about to experience a failure. And here are three dealers that are on your path, on where you're going, that have the part, that are certified to perform the maintenance, and they can help you drive the uptime of your truck. And driving uptime of revenue producing assets, whether it's trucks, as in this case, we have customers that use that for uh, energy pipelines. So use machine learning pipelines to drive uptime of energy pipelines or chocolate manufacturing. It really doesn't right. matter, right? The point is being able to connect all this data into your backend applications and being able to orchestrate not just a machine learning model, but everything across the enterprise and connect them together is what <clears throat> makes this successful. It what helps customers run this in production and what helps them really implement DevOps at scale. Yeah. Well, you know, what's really interesting here from my perspective is we focus on data and I've been in the data world a long time now. And so you have all these efforts that have gone into building data warehouses. And then we kind of go into the big data space and it became data lakes. And then it was, oh, well, it's a lake house architecture. And we're coming up with different architectures. And of course you have master data management. So you can do all this effort to reconcile the data side of the equation, but that's only up to half of the reality. Cause then you have to go over the, you know, jump over the transom basically and hit all these different operational systems. And that also is increasingly challenging now because of things like Kubernetes and container orchestration and so forth. So you have this really interesting couple of different engines. Now you've got these data oriented engines of which Databricks is a key part. And now of course, Mosaic ML, then you have to have your environments where you're connecting all this stuff to the business and orchestrating it. Because wh what you just mentioned, you know, historically, in a, in a sort of SAP environment, you have this monolithic application and you, they tried to put everything inside, right? And then uh, ha what's his name? Hasso Platner comes along and he has this great vision of in memory. And he figured out, hey, you know what? In about eight, nine years, the price of memory is going to come down. It's going to be as cheap or even cheaper than spinning disk. Let's forget all the spinning disk crap and just go in memory. But it was still a monolith, right? So now they're, they've got this monolithic application. And anyone who has worked in that environment knows that trying to accomplish what you just described, Gur, will drive consultants mad. Like they'll try to get it and they'll get 80% uh -huh. of the way there and they won't get the last 20% because someone owns this product or it doesn't, you know, SEC, DevSec ops came into play and said, no, 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 no. So what we're talking about is the big vision of connecting all these dots. And that is truly remarkable, right, Gur? Yeah, connecting everything is, is hard, right? And th the reality is the vision of having everything in one monolithic database where everything connects to everything is a great vision, but it's very difficult to implement right. because let's face it, um, we call this legacy. Uh, in some cases, I will say this legacy is what makes the comp a lot of those companies successful, right? It's, right. it's how they built themselves. But the reality is it's that, that there are layers and layers and layers, right? It's an archaeological science. Right. And just because we built a new system and we have SAP doesn't mean that we don't have anything else in our environment. Right. And what makes it even more complicated is, I mean, we're celebrating this deal today, but companies buy other companies. We have acquisitions, we have spin-offs, we have mergers. Those things happen all the time. And every time you do that, you take disparate applications and systems and you bring them together. So right. yes, connecting those things is tricky. Now at BMC, we've been around for a really long time. We've been helping customers automate and orchestrate workflows for many, many years. From the mainframe to distributed systems, to virtual systems, to cloud systems and uh, containers, et cetera. 
and, and by the way, that's just one, one vector of complexity, right? Because we have different right. data architectures and different application architectures, and you got to bring all those things, right? The data, the applications, and the infrastructure together. But the reality is that when we think about machine learning pipelines, it's an, when we first started looking at it, we said, it's another flavor of, of workflows. Now, it's a complicated flavor, and there's a lot of custom work we had to do to manage it. But we're able to draw on a lot of our, again, legacy, if you may, but mm -hmm. that's what makes us who we are, that really allows us to connect those machine learning pipelines into a lot of the existing applications, which is what many of our customers need in order to really run this in production, really at scale, and really achieve data ops as, as something that helps them drive success in their business. Yeah, and, and there are things like process mining. We'll get into this in the next segment. All these things are coming together right now. And I think it is really, I mean, kind of to your point a moment ago, um, uh, Naveen, we're just at the beginning of understanding what these things are going to do. You know, what gets me really excited is the nexus of observability, orchestration, mm -hmm. process mining, and then these large language models for being able to articulate what you're seeing right? Because if you, once you connect it to your corporate data, it sees all kinds of things in there. That's why you got to be careful yeah. about your data folks. You know, it's going to see things that you didn't know were there. And that's going to help us real quick, like two minutes before the break or a minute and a half, actually. Uh, I'll throw it back over to Naveen. There are tremendous possibilities that we're just now getting a vision of, right? Yeah. I, I think what's interesting talking about the workflows, the, like, like Gar is saying there, these things have been around for a long time. The machine learning and the large language model has actually stereotypes the uh, the flow a little bit, right? Now we have a way to express, um, you know, sort sort of uh, hazy queries to our data, and then actually gather data around input outputs that are good or bad or whatever, and then improve that model. We we've kind of gone all the way from like we have data governance, okay, so we sort of knew I can I can I can exclude or include different blocks of data. But now we have a way to say, okay, I can take that data, put it into a model, put it in front of a user in a useful way, right. and then actually gather feedback against it. And so I think that's actually a huge thing that's happened. And we don't even know how it works yet, to be honest. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. We're, we're, clo we're closing the collapsing, really, the cycle times, right? What used to be a six-month process can now be like a six-day process, for example, or in certain cases, yeah. you know, inside a day or inside two <clears> days. <throat> That is a huge difference because it allows you to play around with things. It allows your team yeah. the flexibility to test ideas very quickly. And if they fail, okay, fine, do something else. You didn't lose six months on a huge project only to realize this stuff isn't even going to work. So it's really important to be able to test, to be able to play around and have fun. And that's what those people like to do. They like to play around and have fun. Folks, don't touch that. I'll be right back. You are listening to DM Radio. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, folks, back here on DM Radio. What a fascinating show here today. We've got Gur Steif from BMC and Naveen Rao from Mosaic ML. And we're just talking about the, really the nexus of all these technologies. And that's why it's so exciting these days, folks. I mean, the cloud in and of itself is this amazing marshalling area for data and functionality. But on-prem, make no mistake, on-prem is going to have a very, very long tail. I don't think on-prem data centers are going away anytime soon, if ever, quite frankly. I think you'll see a bit of a resurgence. And I've actually heard stories that a lot of companies are coming back from the cloud for certain parts of their operations, right? Some things are going to work better on-prem, some things are going to work better in the cloud, really orchestrating all of that is a part of our conversation today and optimizing it and understanding the workflows and being able to get them right. But I did want to get into something that uh, Gerd has mentioned in the break here, which is a really interesting use case. And it, it helps us pull together both the structured and the unstructured data. And folks, that has been the holy grail for quite some time now. I mean, we talk all about structured data. It's very important for your certified reports, for your audits, when you file with the SEC, all these kind of things, you want that to be highly trusted, certified, deterministic. That's the term they use, deterministic data. But then the exploration, the discovery, that's stochastic. You want to open up the discovery to find new things. And Gary, you had a really good example of how this could all come together. Go ahead and share that. Uh, absolutely. And, and you made the point uh, on on on-prem and, and cloud. And, and absolutely, first of all, that is true. Many of our customers are telling us that they are going to continue using on-prem data centers 
for a lot of what I'd call systems of record. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas mm -hmm. they're going to use the cloud more and more for systems of innovation and systems of, of engagement. And this, it's not this or that, it, it's both, right? right? Uh, one of the examples we were talking about during the break was think of an insurance company, right? Uh, a particular policy is a very defined thing and a particular claim is a very defined thing. And there's a lot of regulations around that and how they manage it and what can they do and what can't they do. And so that is probably, probably going to be still in a very structured and handled in a very structured way. And quite possibly, by the way, because there's a lot of sensitive information there stored potentially in a data center. Uh, but that same insurance company can go and say, I'd like to now understand over the last seven years, how many accidents had uh, white sedans involved versus other colors, right? And, and as we know, colors could be a tricky thing because they can have a lot of different names. And how many of those re resulted in bodily injury and how many of those resulted in, in payout above a certain amount or, or something of that, of that sort? Right. And right. Th th there's no SQL, SQL query that you could create to answer <laughs> that because a lot of that is unstructured data. Right. right? And so this is a great example of, of how uh, machine learning models and natural language models can, can just provide tremendous value to customers. Yeah. Out of the box. And, you know, Naveen, I'll throw this one over to you. I had a guy uh, interview from a company called Optima, a very, very clever guy. It's a consultancy that has an office here in Pittsburgh. And he was talking about how he uses chat GPT. And he actually uses Bard more, I think he was saying. But he will take highly complex documents, like a technical brief that's 100 pages long, and just pump it into these engines and say, give me a two-page summary. And bup, 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 it just bangs it out for you. And I can say, now give me more detail on this segment. Bup, 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 just bangs that out. That is an incredibly clever way. It's basically a dynamic Cliff's Notes engine for those right. who remember Cliff's Notes, right? Like read this corpus of text and tell me the five most important characters. Boom, done. I mean, that is crazy powerful and it will help educate people in the business. This is the other side of the equation, right? A lot of people I think on the outside don't realize how much people on the inside don't know because how would they know it? Would they never have come across these documents? So it's a great discovery mechanism for helping you quickly ascertain what this means, what that means in this context. That's pretty good stuff. What do you think, Naveen? Yeah, I mean, now imagine that you have a model that's an expert at a particular domain and it can really give you kind of almost not expert opinions, but almost like a, a, an expert narrative on a particular type of document, right? Like. ChatGPT is fine for, for prose, for English, right? But like if I feed it a legal document, it doesn't do so well, right? Because it's not built for that kind of a thing. Uh, you can start to build more domain specificity here. But I think really what's happened now is this uh, ability to collapse across structured and unstructured. And why is that important? Structured data is kind of where we kept, um, you know, the things that you can really enumerate. You have tables and, and, and spreadsheets and numbers and, and, and that kind of thing. But what was always lacking was the context, right? What that, that structured data requires some context, like an Excel spreadsheet needs, you need to know what's in the spreadsheet to understand what that really means. And now right. we can start to integrate these two things together, right? And LLMs have been, and large language models have allowed us to do that. We can basically take this very amorphous kind of uh, natural language, like how humans interact and right. actually start to collapse it down into schema. To some extent, we, we discover the schema from the data and then you can actually start to uh, interact with it along with the structured data together. And I think that that's just so powerful. It's something we haven't had yet. And that's really what's new. And I think that's what's exciting for enterprise, frankly. And so this gets into something we talked about on a previous show, which is dynamic schema design and optimization, right? Because if you look at the history of schemas, and I remember when, you know, when Hadoop came out and everyone got all excited, oh, schema on read, all this stuff. And yeah, it didn't work out quite like they wanted to, but I think it began the process of understanding this can be dynamic as well, because historically yeah. a schema in an old world database, you know, once you set that thing to change it, it especially with a lot of data in production, you know, good luck with that one. So you right. like migrate and just do terrible, awful things. But now we can learn more by just watching. And I, I think all this comes together. I always talk about the process mining stuff because I find that so interesting. But to your point, we can now more so than ever before, let the data, let the text talk to us and share with us what the heck is going on in there. That's yeah. a big change, right? That's a, a major inflection point. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, 
But the key is now uh, you start looking at, um, you know, a block of text, a legal document or something like that. And, you know, when you ask a human about what's in, in a document, you actually get it through their lens, right? It, if I ask a lawyer to read a legal document, I'm asking for their lens. I want them to interpret it for me because they're an expert at that sort of thing. Um, that's where we have to start being really careful. And this is where like, uh, I think the influence of large language models starts to become very important and why it's actually critical for many people, many companies to be able to build their own because that lens, that bias is a good thing, it's useful. I right. want a lawyer to have a bias because they, they're an expert at that field. I want a doctor to have a bias because they're an expert at that field. But now we got to be very careful about um, making sure we're picking the right in interpretation when we read these kind of documents and, hmm. and using that, uh, uh, to, to, you know, for some sort of an end, right? Like I'm, I'm doing an insurance claim. Okay. I need to have somebody who understands what an insurance claim is. I need to understand someone who understands the bounds of uh, of what's good, what's bad, what's uh, uh, what's normal, what's not. And that's actually where it starts getting really tricky. Yeah. And uh, real quick, I'll throw it to you and then we'll bring Ger back in. When you talk about these focused models, because I think yeah. that's where the real value is going to be. So not just banking, for example, but online banking or yeah. certain fields of, of legal study. Are you, do you basically just take the found the existing foundational model and, and whittle it down or, or do you build a separate model? How does that work? Um, we actually do a bit of both. You know, uh, I, I would say there's a reticence or even a fear on, on how hard it is to build your own model. We we're demystifying that. That's largely what Mosaic ML has done. Hmm. And, uh, we so we can enable customers to build their own from scratch and we can intermingle it with their own custom data with with existing sort of general data um that's actually the most powerful way to build a model uh, because of the sphere we do see a lot of people taking an existing model like we've actually released some of the state-of-the-art models uh in, in the wild and uh taking those models and then what we call fine-tune them with customer specific data Mm -hmm. It's a weaker way to modify the behavior of the model, but it does work to some degree. I, I think as people get more comfortable with this model building concept, they'll just do that. It's a much more powerful way to, to build a, a domain specific model. Yeah, well, and I'll throw this over to Guru. This this is why I get so excited, right? These are at least any even mid-sized organization has a lot of data, right? And I'm a marketer for, at heart. So there's a lot of marketing data out there. Who opened which email at what time? Which emails did they open? Which did they not open? I mean, you can throw algorithms at this stuff and find really interesting patterns of behavior that you can then use to customize your outreach. And I can tell you, that's really important stuff these days because everyone's getting hammered with emails, with social feeds, with all these different feeds coming in. So knowing how to separate wheat from chaff becomes a real serious issue. I can tell you that email is still king. I don't care what they what anyone says. Email still rocks for being able to get people to transact and, and do business with you. But just being able to, to let the data talk to you, that's what we've been trying to do for years. And I feel like we're really onto something now. What do you think, Ger? I, I agree. So, so the, the amount of insight you can derive from data is amazing. And of course, the trick is how to operationalize that insight, right? We've been talking about it earlier, right? It, it, the models have become really good. And I agree with Davin that we're just scratching the surface. There's a lot more to come. But those models are becoming really good. You can get a lot of really good models that come up with really good insights. It's then the trick is getting that and, and actually applying this to how you do marketing, to how you, you do promotions and, and really operationalizing this on a day in, day out so that you can continue to tweak the model and immediately take action on it, right? So it's not just a scientist comes up with some interesting observation and now we have a long meeting and thinking about what we're gonna do about it. It's how do I operationalize it, right? The, the, the challenge for enterprises is how do I act on the data and how do I turn it into insights that are then operationalized and drive a business outcome? And I think we've done some amazing uh, work on that over the, the last few years. And I'm excited about what that's going to uh, to mean forward. And I agree, email is still king. <laughs> yeah, email is still king. Well, and just understanding human behavior. I mean, that's half the half the battle. And Naveen, maybe I'll throw this over to you. What I've seen with these uh, with these models that's very compelling is they can, with the right prompt, they can give you eighty percent of what you want, 
even in very complex technology discussions. So, you know, like technical white papers, for example, they're very good at articulating use cases for software, for example, or things to watch out for, like short lists. What are the <clears> 10 <throat> things I need to know about X? And as opposed to Google, which will just give you a list of links to look at, or maybe a short definition, it actually writes this stuff out in prose for you. So you have something to work from. Now you will need to do the last 20% to get it just right for your business. But if everyone, if every marketer had 80% of their job done when they walked in, I think they'd all be pretty happy about that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's actually the primary use case for the next five or six years is just, you know, adding to augmenting what humans can do and doing it faster, right? I, I, the, I call it the, the Copilot 4X um, mm -hmm. pattern, right? And so that's really like Copilots for doctors, for lawyers, for engineers, for artists, whatever, right? And so that's really kind of where the value is going to come. Um, you know, let, let's take a quick step back on why these models work, maybe, uh, yeah. if that's of interest. Like, you know, what's... Uh, a lot of people think of it as magic. Really, all these models are doing, they're trained in an auto-regressive way. Okay. What that means is I take a large block of data, uh, a book or you know some, some text like a, a bunch of Twitter feeds. And basically, given the past string, I'm at some point in a sentence, I use the path and I try to predict the next word. That's all they do. And they're literally trained on constantly trying to predict the next word given the past. So mm -hmm. what that creates is a model that has sort of many, many contexts exposed to it. It says like, well, when I see this sort of paragraph preceding, these are the things I tend to see afterwards. It basically mm -hmm. builds a statistical model around this. So it actually, if you think about it, what a human does, that's kind of what we do too. We take like, oh, I, we've been talking about this subject and I know what I'm going to talk about next. That's essentially what the model is learning. And so this idea that it can kind of you know, recapitulate human behavior is really just coming from this, this contextual view. And uh, uh, I think that's why they seem so powerful is that I, it, by just predicting that next word and building a statistical model around it by looking at the past, I've actually kind of come up with something that I can prompt that becomes the input that allows me to start the next prediction and, and give, it, give it enough context to draw from a huge corpus of human knowledge, mm -hmm. trillions of words that it's been trained on that frankly encompasses almost all of our behaviors, right? We're not so complicated after all. After you've thrown a few trillion words at, uh, at something, you've basically captured 99% of what most humans do. Yeah. And so that, that's why these things work. And that's, that's kind of the, the code that's been cracked. It's really cool, actually. Yeah, well, my friend from uh, Optima, uh, Lou Simon is his name, very, very smart guy. He made a good point about the healthcare industry. And I've thought this for a long time. I mean, I, I've paid some attention to the healthcare space. I was pre-med for a year. And I thought to myself, you know, at scale, when you can analyze 150,000 MRI scans and then be able to look at the text of what presented in the, in the patient, et cetera, that's going to be really powerful as, again, an aid to the doctor to understand right. or to at least to not overlook things that you're still going to have to make a determination about what you as a doctor think this is. But to have all this assistance behind you, and, and what did he say? He made a good point. He goes, now these models have so much of this information. And so they're really good as, as understanding what doctors need to know. And today is the dumbest they'll ever be. Right. So it's like they get smarter as more information gets baked in. Now you do have to kick models now and again. You do have to watch out for overfitting models and things of this nature. But nonetheless, as an assistant, it's like an assistant with tremendous amounts of knowledge sitting next to you all day. And the more you work with it, the better off it's going to be to understanding what you want. So we're just at the beginning, folks. Don't touch that dollar. We'll be right back. You're listening to DM Radio. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, folks, back here on DM Radio, talking to two real experts, visionaries in our field, quite frankly, Naveen Rao of Mosaic ML and Gert Steif from BMC, talking all about orchestration and generation, generating content. And I was saying the break there, and I'll throw this to each of our guests, 
I believe that most of the value we're going to get from AI in general over the next years will be in the form of suggestions. And you're already seeing this. Google did some interesting stuff with Gmail a couple of years ago where it was automatically suggesting to me which emails to follow up on. And I have to say, it did a pretty good job. And then one day it just stopped. So I don't know if there was a setting I needed to, to assign or, or do, but I'll have to look into that again. It was doing a pretty good job. And just to give it a little baseball analogy, because I'm so excited that my nine-year-old loves baseball. She wants to go to the Pirates games all the time. So I'm like, yes, this is good. And uh, I always get concerned when we're pitching and I see the pitcher shake off the catcher with, with his suggestion. I'm like, oh, no, here comes the gopher ball home run we lose but uh, you'll be able to track when you use the suggestions did it work did it not work and that helps you score the model over time Gur, what do you think i think you're gonna get a lot of power of suggestion coming from these ai models absolutely so 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 i mean to Naveen's point earlier right this is a suggestion right it's a predictive system and it predicts an answer and there are two questions, right? It's what's your degree of confidence? And there's a question of what's the consequences if it's wrong, right? Which is why you, you want to make sure that sometimes it's a suggestion and you actually double check it. And in some cases, you may just go and say, I'm just going to automate this and it's going to, because it's probably good enough and the consequences of making a mistake are not great. But in many cases, it will be a suggestion and we have to follow up on it. When we talk about it, there are so many processes in, in corporations that have been around for a really, really long time. Right. And there's a lot of improvement opportunity, right? Now, are you going to take a process that you've been running for a long time and just autom just change it? No, you're probably going to want to look at it. You probably want to uh, validate that the suggestion is valid. But I absolutely agree that the for, for the next few years, we're going to see a lot of suggestions and then depending on what are the consequences if the suggestion is wrong, right, they'll either be automated into let's take an action or somebody is going to still have to look at it before taking an action. Yeah, right. You know, Naveen, I'm going to throw a little curveball over at you. I think that one of the other things we're going to see here in the very near future is uh, a sort of dissolution of organizational hierarchical boundaries, and what I mean by mm -hmm. that is you're going to see people doing things that are adjacent to them because you used to have to go to the copywriter to do something or go to the marketing team or whatever. I think you're going to see more and more sort of multi-domain expertise developing because teams are going to be a little bit smaller and because we have all these tools now that we can use now. And I think that's good news because I think that you know, a lot mm -hmm. of the trouble in business comes from organizational silos when it becomes us versus them or sales versus marketing or management versus sales or whatever. There's always this friction. And I think that these technologies are going to start to, to mitigate that and we'll get people who are better at seeing across traditional boundaries. What do you think? Oh, I, I agree that you'll, you'll enable more people to do more. I mean, honestly, it's, it's actually, it's a continuum of what we've seen for a number of years. I mean, think back 25 years, just booking a flight. How yeah. hard was that? Yeah. You have to call up a, a travel agent and they have some crazy database system they type on for five minutes to pull up a flight. I mean, now I, you know, when I go on Expedia or whatever and I got access to every flight in the world, right? It's not a big deal. Um, Google has really collapsed, you know, researching things. I mean, it's interesting during my PhD, I had, uh, I had to go back and find some old papers that were not digitized, right? They were only in print. I had to go into the library stacks and find them and photocopy them and and cite them that way. It, it took me, you know, an afternoon to, to pull up three or four papers. Whereas you do it online, it just it happens in seconds. So I think this idea that like we collapsed uh, the the expertise needed to get to certain information is just happening more and more and more. And so yeah. it's great because it enables people who aren't experts at particular things to access ninety percent of that expertise on tap. There's yeah. still value to the high end expertise. But like you just you just spread out uh, these capabilities to many more people. And that, that's generally a good thing. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And girl, I'll throw it over to you. I know you've been around for a while now. Getting teams to work together is really important stuff. I mean, getting absolutely. IT and business to collaborate. Go ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, it, it used to be that the, the, the biggest user of Control N was IT people, right? It isn't anymore. It's business people. 
mm. right? Because they're automating business processes. They're not automating IT process. There's no IT process anymore. If it doesn't right. support the business, nobody cares. Well, maybe running backups once a day is an IT process. But <laughs> if it doesn't support the business, nobody cares. So my biggest consumer in most companies is the business. That does not mean that IT or, or, or whomever does not have anything to do with the solution, but the level of collaboration, the number of projects that are driven by the biz, by a business function versus an IT function, is it just completely changed over the last few years. Mind mm -hmm. you, because of that, right? If, if 20 years ago somebody heard that I'm in technology and they would ask me, you know, what fix my PC they should buy or how to fix their printer, they know better than that now. They ask my teenage kids. Because right. they'll do a better job of that. <laughs> it, it's, it's really interesting how that changed. But the fact that the technology is now pervasive, everybody understands technology. Everybody understands how to use technology. And people are doing more and more creative things in the business. And that is only going to continue. And that is a good thing. But it, it means that we have to, in the technology field, we have to evolve with it and, and help our customers do that effectively. Yeah, that's a really good point. And Naveen, I'll throw it back over to you here. Um, I'm very impressed with the vision of Databricks because you know here you've got a structured data engine that they built on top of Spark and they see, hey, this generative AI stuff is a really big deal. Let's go out and broker a deal with this company that's really doing an excellent job in that space. These are very different spaces, but they have to come together in the business, and they would typically come together through different uh, product acquisitions by an organization, right? Now, yeah. you have this one company that has a big vision for the future. I think that's a pretty seriously big deal, and I'm guessing that's why you're excited to be part of Databricks now, right? Yeah, I mean, I think this fits it fits in line with what they wanted to do from the start. To be honest, um, you know, they 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 correctly recognized that most companies were not yet ready for machine learning, you know, ten years ago, and so they focus on the data problem. And really, they've added so much to that, going from just dump your data into something, and then you automatically discover lots lots of uh, things about it. Um, Really, this is sort of that next stage of activating that data. And it, it makes total sense. And it, it just felt very natural. Uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, friction and discussion of like what we're going to be doing together. It's really just the nuts and bolts of how we get there. Right. So um, to me, it was it was a bit of a no brainer for us. It was there were not many companies that we would even consider being part of this. Right. One of maybe on the maybe the only one I don't know. I'd have to think about it more, but. Really, it was such a natural fit uh, because of that overarching vision. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, Ger, to throw it back over to you, I mean, the nice part about what you guys do is that you are productionalizing these technologies. And th that is not going to be a problem that will go away. Now, APIs made life a lot easier, for sure, if you have to connect to APIs. But like we said, on-prem is going to have a very long tail. And uh, and actually, I'll, I'll throw my, my one of my favorite jokes. I think you're going to appreciate this. One guy gave me the best description I've ever heard for def for defining what a legacy system is. And a legacy system is any system that's in production. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my lines. That is very true. That is very, Isn't that very good? true. I agree. I mean, anything that has to do with productionalizing things, right? I mean, innovation is great. And it's the lifeblood of, of, of business. But absolutely, you have to find a way how to operationalize it and how to turn it into something that drives value. Right. You know, uh, lasers were invented in the early 60s and were a really interesting uh, innovation that took about seven years until somebody figured what That's they could right. actually do with it. <laughs> That's right. right. Like, there's a lot of things like that, uh, that, that just the fact that you can do something doesn't mean that you know how to drive it, how to drive value out of it. And that is what we help customers do. And that, that's a, a wonderful thing. And we're, we'll continue evolving with our customers, which is how we're, how, how we're going to drive success for everybody, for our customers in particular. Yeah. And I think that uh, there should be some algorithm out there that finds out the duration of time from when something appears in a James Bond movie and when it's actually commercially available. Because they're <laughs> always ahead with the lasers and the different things, right? They're always ahead of the game. 
But uh, it's like, you know, five to 10 years, I think, after you see it in a Bond film, and it's going to be commercially available uh, to the rest of the world. But folks, look these guys up online, Mosaic ML, very, very cool technology. Of course, BMC, these guys are veterans in the space. And uh, I want to know what you want to know. Do you want to be on this show? Just send me an email, info at dmradio.biz that comes straight to me, or info at insideanalysis.com, our other show comes straight to me. Folks, it's going to be so much fun in this business for the next five, 10 years, man. It's going to be just rock'em. Like I just played rock'em, sock'em robots just a couple of days ago in Texas with my daughter. And it was fun watching her enjoy that. It's going to be the case in enterprise software. We'll talk to you next time. You've been listening to DM Radio. All right, folks, time for the podcast bonus segment here on DM Radio. What a fantastic show we just had with Naveen Rao from Mosaic ML, now part of Databricks, of course, and also Gur Steif from BMC. Just wanted to unpack a couple of things that we didn't get to tackle in the show proper, one of which is this whole uh, issue of the narrative, right? And uh, I was joking with our guests before the show today about my truism that the narrative is always wrong. And what I mean by that is the narrative is a story and stories get embellished and the embellishment can kind of take on a life of its own. And then pretty soon you're kind of off track and not really accurately representing what's going on. And so, you know, you see these narratives in the media all the time. And of course, in the world of big media and in the American culture, at least these days, but also around the world, there's this whole fear about AI taking away jobs, um, the red-eyed robot taking over, all this kind of fun stuff. And uh, that's just not really what's happening at all. Now, you could argue that there are jobs that will be replaced or there will be headcount reduced, for example, is one way to look at it. But it's not so much that the AI is going to take anyone's job. It's that people who know how to use AI are going to be better equipped to get jobs and keep jobs in the future. And that's why I encourage everyone out there, everyone listening to this, definitely hop online, play around with these large language models to better understand what they do and how they operate. They are very complex, but to Naveen's point, all they're really doing is predicting what they think you want to hear. So in a way, it's almost, it's almost like the ultimate yes man, right? Or you remember yes man, yes, sir, you're right, sir, good job, sir. In that they will tell you what they think you want to hear. So the prompt becomes important. You have to be careful about what you put into a prompt and then watch what you get back and then pay attention. And, and the funny thing about chat GPT is you can just tell it, no, I want this instead. Okay, add this, add that. You can amend the prompts and it will amend along with you. It'll go right there along with you. So it's almost like an incredibly knowledgeable intern that will do whatever you want it to do in terms of creating text. And of course, that's what these things do. A, a large language model is a text generator and you can give it prompts to get very complicated text. As I mentioned in the show, lists, top 10 lists. What are the top 10 things I need to focus on if I'm going to build a business in marketing in the Pittsburgh market, for example? That's something that you could do. What are the top five companies I should talk to if I'm trying to build an analytics solution? What are the top 20 things I have to worry about if I'm going to start an integration program, for example? These are excellent prompts to feed into an engine like Bard or ChatGPT or these others that are coming out because they give you a framework. It's almost like a wireframe, but it's more than a wireframe. As I suggested, it's about 80% of a finished product you can get with a simple prompt. And I have to say, if you haven't done it yet, I promise the first time you do it, it's going to blow your mind because you're going to watch it go da, 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 and just like bang all this stuff out. And what's really fun is if you get a hard question, It'll take a second to think about it. And you can sit there and watch the prompt and you know that this engine is like, hmm, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Okay, bup, 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 and it just starts printing out all these text uh, language in front of you, just right there, just right before you. It's just amazing. So this stuff is going to be huge. It's not going to go away. Uh, the other shoe may drop on the cost, for example. We'll figure out what's going on with all that. Uh, but I just promise you, I beseech you, spend the time, look into this, Check these things out, play around with them. As Naveen suggested, it's heavily valuable for marketers, for people who need to create content. It's good for writers too. I'm not suggesting that you should write a whole article using ChatGPT, but at least again, you get the wireframe 
and you get the basics of what you need to cover. And then you can work with that and add your style to it, add your flavor to it. But it is a very powerful engine. And unlike Google, which will just point you to pages where you can do more research, these large language models will fuse all this stuff together. And remember, that's what they're really doing is they're fusing vectors of information based upon the corpus of text that was used to train them and the prompt that you give. So there is a marriage that occurs between the prompt and what you're trying to pull from this reservoir, from this resource. I was talking to a guy today about Encyclopedia Britannica. It has a thousand million Encyclopedia Britannicas baked into it. The large language models do, but they do have fake information as well. They have opinion, they have facts, they have all kinds of different things that have to be sorted out by you, the end user. But I promise, start using these things. Play around with them, have some fun with them, use them to create content, use them to create marketing material for your business. Very, very powerful stuff, very useful. And send me an email, info at dmradio.biz. We'll talk to you next time, folks. You have been listening to DM Radio.